So I'm Nora Bashara from Upcycle Design School. And I'm so excited to have Holly Mayton, who is a research fellow at the US Embassy. And I'm going to let her get started and take it from here. Thanks so much, Nor, and nice to meet you. Oh, sorry, sorry, I muted you by mistake. I meant to meet myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> so nice to meet everybody. Like Nor said, I'm Holly. Um, I've, I've got my PhD in environmental engineering, but have been interested in science policy for a long time and have ended up now at the US Department of State's Office of Agriculture Policy. Um, and so my colleague Paul is here as well. He's also in our office. Um, and I'll tell you a little more about me as well in a bit, but let me start sharing my screen. Let's see, you guys can all see those slides okay? I see some nodding. Awesome. So I'm excited to be here and to tell you all about sustainable cotton through biotechnology, which is something uh, that we work on a lot um, in our office um, and something I've learned about a lot recently. Um, and I learned a lot simply about cotton in preparing for this presentation. So I'm really excited to share it with you all and uh, see what you take away from this information and um, yeah, just kind of have a cool discussion. And so uh, just a little overview of what we're going to go through today. As I mentioned, I'll tell you a little bit more about me and my background um, and my connection to sustainability and to agriculture. Um, and then we'll talk kind of broadly about sustainability and biotech cotton and some background there. And then I've got three case studies I pulled out from three different countries um, of where biotech has enabled cotton to be produced more sustainably around the world. And then I'll just briefly talk about some of the bigger picture things related to biotechnology, other crops and other benefits that might have. And then we'll have some time hopefully for, for Q and A and any, anything you guys wanna talk about. And so I'm gonna try something with you guys. If you on your phones or on your computer you can go to this website called menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. Um, and so this will help me get to know who you all are just a little bit before I tell you about me. <laughs> and so once you're at menti.com, you can enter this code that's on the screen, 69885821. And let's see if I can switch, oh, which screen I'm sharing. I think that worked. Can you guys see the world map now on the screen? So I've never tried this, this little map before on Menti, but you should be able to drop a pin. And I know Nora just asked this question, so maybe this one is not as fun. Is someone really from the middle of the ocean or is it just frozen? Yeah, mine worked. Mine let me drop the pin. But now it says, uh, please wait for the presenter to show the next slide. Hmm. Oh, here. Now I have the next one. All right, maybe we'll just skip the map since I heard you all say before. Oh, there we go. I have one in DC. <laughs> All right, thanks people who dropped their pins. I have a few more questions on here if folks are able to get to menti.com. I can wait a minute too if people are, are navigating there. Let's try the next one. All right. So my next question for you all in the audience is what are your, is your area or areas of expertise or that you study? Just curious to know what you all are interested in and, and already maybe know about. We might only have one person. Are other people able to get to this or are you having a hard time? I think this is just Nor. <laughs> Oh, we got some more sustainable fashion here. Awesome. All right. 
right, that's good. I'm glad we have some people who have been thinking about sustainability a lot. And so my last question here is what you all are hoping to learn or take away from today before I jump in. Maybe I can hit on any of these points that folks are interested in if they come up. We'll definitely talk about sustainability broadly. So that's a good one. And about cotton production, for sure. A lot goes into it. Uh, so I learned. <laughs> oh, good. The comparison with organic cotton is something I, I added at the end. That I'll be curious to get you all's feedback on. So that's good to see. All right, so let's see if I can switch back. I'm really using the technology today. So are we back on my slides? You guys can see this now. All right. Yeah, we can see the slides. Excellent. Uh, so thank you guys for that quick poll. There'll be a few more later, so don't lose that mentee link. Um, but as, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm a little bit of a untraditional person to be working in policy. Um, I've been a lot of different types of engineer over the course of my career. I started out as a chemical engineer in undergrad. Um, I really wanted to work on uh, energy sustainability at the time. I was doing a lot about uh, using waste to energy systems, uh, studied some nanotechnology at the time and worked in a research lab, um, and then decided to, to get my PhD because I felt like I wasn't done learning. And so I, I went to a program where I was studying environmental engineering uh, and really looking at water quality systems and the food water water energy nexus um, and did a lot of research on how different bacteria move in water. Uh, thinking mostly about food safety, but also about how contaminants move around the world in agricultural systems. And then after that, I, I went and did a postdoc in a totally different type of engineering, bioengineering. Uh, and for about a year, I was a molecular biologist working on tiny proteins uh, and programming them to be able to break apart other bacteria cell walls. Um, and that was a lot of fun, but along the way, I've always been really interested in more of the application of my research and making sure that it benefits society rather than being the one doing the research myself. Um, and so that's what really led me to pursue this world of science policy and is what has brought me to the State Department and the US government to work on how food and agricultural policy um, really can, can benefit the world through science. And so the, the common thread through all of these different types of engineering and work has really been agriculture. Um, as an undergrad, I traveled to Nicaragua several times with Engineers Without Borders, uh, worked in rural communities that really relied on, on cocoa and um, corn. And so that's kind of my first picture here as I was young and excited to be in a corn field on a mountain. Um, and then in graduate school, I was studying really a lot of salad greens as food safety. And so I spent a lot of time in fields. That's me holding a head of romaine freshly picked. Um, and then, like I said, you know, I, I studied food safety and was able to do a lot with uh, programs called like the Global Food Initiative, uh, the Borlaug Center on Global Food Security, um, being a lab researcher, but keeping an eye towards the world and application of science that whole time. Um, and just one project that I did in graduate school that I was thinking about a lot as I was preparing this presentation for you all was a project I went to Hanoi, Vietnam for the summer and worked with a research center there called the International Center for Tropical Agriculture that was doing this project trying to figure out what does it really mean to have a sustainable diet in Vietnam. And so we did a lot of interviews with stakeholders, read a lot of other papers, looked at data for the summer, um, and there's a whole paper we published that's quite academic around what it means to be have a sustainable diet in Vietnam based on kind of what the policy makers and the public thought there. Um, but I just wanted to pull out this one graphic to show you how complicated it really is and how different factors are going to be important for different parts of whether it's a food system or a textile system, whether we're eating it or wearing it. Um, I think more than just the production itself is important, right? There's sort of these, that's the gray here, are these, how is it produced? How is it moved around and how is it used? 
Um, and then of course for, for fashion and for food, of course, there should be almost another arrow there. But then there's sort of the next level of kind of immediate impacts and influences that go there for, for food. That's a lot of loss and waste and how safe it is. And there's even broader impacts and influences that we think about too with sustainable, right? Is, you know, how good is it for your health? How good is it for the environment long-term? How, you know, does it make sense financially and economically? And so um, I wanted before I jump into some of what I think is, is sustainable um, is to ask you all what you think. And so let's see if I can switch again. So there should be a question in Mentee again that says, what does it mean to be sustainable? So I'm curious from, don't have to think too hard about it, but if you all have kind of a definition on your mind or a way that you think about sustainability, I should be curious to see it. If anyone just joined us, you can participate in this little poll by going to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And then there's a code at the top of the screen for or eight numbers that you can punch in and then it'll ask you to answer this question. I got some good definitions to start with here. So not harm the environment or have a negative or having a smaller impact on the environment. Harms the effects to environment. Mm -hmm. and circular design. Anyone else working on an answer? We can wait a little bit. Any of my agriculture friends wanna, wanna chime in? <laughs> I'll just give it one more, one more minute. All right, feel free to keep adding definitions if you are still thinking about it. We'll come back to that screen shortly. Um, and so I think about, have thought about this question a lot and was thinking about it as I was kind of preparing this presentation. Um, and when I think about sustainable, and I think this is, this is from an online publication as well, thinking about all three pillars. So the environment is of course, the one we most commonly think of, the most important place where sustainability and climate change are kind of directly on our minds. But there's also the two other equal pillars of, of social sustainability. So. Um, how good is it for, for people, for livelihoods, resilience, equity? How much is sustainable society being, being maintained? Um, and then the economic pillar, of course, which I alluded to with the sustainable diets graphic, right? Is that, is it economically sustainable? There might be something that's great to do for the environment, but is going to cost farmers tons and tons of money, right? So is that truly a sustainable solution in that case? So those three pillars are, are sort of how I framed this presentation and are how I thought about these three case studies that I think represent those three examples of, of how something can be sustainable. Uh, but in my, in my research, I came across this organization called Cotton Up. I don't know if you guys have seen that this guide to sourcing sustainable cotton online. And I, I quite liked their definition of sustainable, which is uh, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, which I think is, is good and broad and encompasses all three of those pillars potentially. Um, and then they kind of define it even more closely. I took a screenshot from their website on the bottom here that they really, in terms of cotton production and sustainability, um, they really think about number one, reducing hazardous inputs and chemicals that are used in production think about water usage as the second category of sustainability. 
And then lastly, in, in economic sustainability, are we reducing poverty um, and just alleviating economic burdens on farmers and on workers through cotton production to be truly sustainable? So with those three pillars in mind, I have one more question for you guys before I dive into our, our case studies. Let's see. So this is just a quick poll and we might just get Nor's answers here unless anyone else gets on, on Menti. <laughs> but which of these fibers do you think are the most sustainable? Just from what you know coming into this coming into this presentation. I think it might ask you to rank them from uh, first being most sustainable, fifth being least sustainable. We have some competing opinions at the bottom there. So it looks like for the most part, you guys think cotton and wool are, are quite sustainable materials. Um, probably rayon in the middle and then nylon and polyester are the same on the bottom. Martha's nodding, so. <laughs> it seems like we're in agreement. And you guys are actually almost exactly in line with uh, this poll by the Cotton Council International, uh, which people thought the same, that cotton was the most safe for the environment and the most sustainably produced, um, followed by wool, rayon, nylon, and polyester. Uh, and so unfortunately, I have to be the ones to tell you that that is not the case <laughs> right now. Um, and so this is a this is a graphic from uh, that compiled a bunch of different research articles that looked at in terms of environmental impact of the materials that we use, which ones from cradle to gr cradle to gate they call it uh, has the most environmental impact. And so you won't be surprised that cow leather and silk uh, are amongst the highest environmental impacts, but cotton actually comes in third. Um, and most of that is because of the impact on, on water scarce regions. That's the dark blue, the darkest bar here. Um, and it just requires so much water to produce cotton compared to other materials, right, that aren't grown. Um, so that's a big factor for us to, to think about as we're thinking about how sustainable is cotton in, in the big picture of the, the environmental footprint that it has. Um, the other bars here just are, are direct emissions for greenhouse gases, you can see wool is much larger there than cotton in that kind of medium green. And then eutrophication is one that is related to the excess of nutrients emitted into the environment. So the um, fertilizer um, that is applied to the field that ends up going to waste, that's another big piece that for, for wool and cotton comes into play that doesn't for some of the others. So that's just something to think about as we're, we're going forward and, and I was, as I was researching cotton, I was pretty surprised to find out, I don't know if you all knew, that a lot of cotton is, is not actually used to make clothes. About a third of it is for textiles and apparel, um, but it's worth noting the other parts of cotton are often used as filler for things like fertilizer, animal feed, um, packaging, um, lots of different products um, and things come out of cotton. So producing cotton sustainably is not just about our clothes, though that's the thing we often think about and is the piece that we're going to interact with the most closely. Um, there's a lot of other applications of cotton uh, that are important too. And then I, we mentioned the water piece since it was the most prominent contributor of environmental impact for cotton. Um, and cotton is actually considered one of the most water uh, resource intensive crops. Um, this graph is showing for a bunch of different agricultural products, how much of that product is grown in a water stressed region of the world. Um, and so you can see cotton is more than half is grown in a water stress region of the world. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's just the climate that works the best for growing cotton. But that means we have to keep in mind, how can we grow cotton as efficiently as possible so we're not doing further damage to communities that need drinking water and other cotton uses in the world. So lots of other crops on there as well. 
the ones that grow in tropical environments, of course, often aren't grown in a, a more likely a, a water stressed area. <clears throat> so just a few other things to think about in terms of cotton and the agricultural inputs that go into it. Um, so in the bottom here, you see that the land use that for cotton around the world is about two and a half percent. Um, but pesticide use, total pesticide use in the world, about 16% of that goes onto cotton. Um, so there's definitely a lot of, of room for improvement there um, of decreasing the amount of, of inputs we have to use for cotton itself. Um, but of course it does impact 100 million workers across the world directly um, and could be a lot, a lot more by their families and things like that. So that's something to think about too is we're in benefiting a lot of people um, in the economic and social sustainability as we as we work on a lot of this stuff. So before um, we jump into some of the case studies, I wanted to give you sort of a, a broader overview about biotech cotton um, and some of the background. So I'm trying to move our faces out of the way. Um, so, so biotech cotton actually was first introduced and grown commercially around the world around 1996. And three of the, the first adopting countries were the United States, Mexico, and Australia. And, and this type of cotton, it's called BT cotton, um, was the, the product that's been grown most widely, um, was actually just an adaptation of, a, of, of something they were already doing. So there's a, a lot of pests that bother cotton, of course, around the world. Um, and they were using this bacteria that produced something that was toxic to the pests. So if the pests eat this bacteria, Bacillus thuringis, thuringiesis, <laughs> if the bacteria eat, or the, uh, the bugs eat that bacteria, they get sick and die. Uh, and so it sort of was an organic option for them to apply to the cotton, the bugs would eat it, and that would protect the cotton itself. Um, since really like 1920, cotton growers around the world were using this. But of course, applying that bacteria uh, you have to do that a lot. It requires a lot of labor. Um, it, it, of course, costs money to go out and, and buy it and apply it. And then you have to do it multiple times. If it rains and washes it off, right, your cotton is susceptible again. And so what biotech cotton did is they genetically engineered the cotton to produce this bacteria, this particular part of the bacteria that was toxic to the pests by itself. So farmers didn't have to apply it anymore. They could just grow the cotton that was already producing that. Um, and so from, from 1996 to 2007, uh, so over the course of about 10 years, uh, there was like a almost a 25% decrease in the amount of insecticides that had to be used in the countries that adopted this biotech cotton, uh, which is a huge, huge success and it saved them a lot of money as well as environmental impact. Um, and then of course, there's even more we can do with biotech cotton in the future uh, as technology develops to make it resistant to more pests and even more conditions like drought and things like that. So that's just sort of the, the short summary of the most common type of biotech cotton that's used around the world. Um, and one more poll before we jump into the case studies from here. So I told you that there were three initially adopting countries of biotech cotton, the US, Mexico, and Australia. Um, and so how many countries do you guys think grow biotech cotton today around the world? We've got one vote for 10 to 20. So everybody thinks somewhere in the middle. I'm glad no one thinks that we've slid back to zero at least. <laughs> All right, so most of you are right. There's 18 countries right now around the world that grow biotech cotton um, in some way or another. And I'll show you a, a map later with all the different types of biotech crops grown around the world. Um, but you can see they're really, they're spread almost evenly between Latin America, North America, a couple in Africa and in Asia and Australia, of course, that I'll talk about in a bit. And so I'm going to focus on just some case studies, like I said, from three countries for the next couple of minutes. Um, and I chose these three countries as examples because, like I said, I think they feature the three pillars of sustainability that biotech cotton can help us accomplish. One being the, the economic pillar. So how can we grow and produce more cotton for the world uh, while using less inputs? 
uh, thus saving farmers money. So that's going to be it from Mexico. The second being environmental benefits, focusing on that water conservation piece that we saw was so important um, in cotton's environmental impact. So Australia, uh, if you all know anything about Australia, you know they have chronic droughts. So that was really important for Australia. And then in India, I'll finally talk about how uh, biotech cotton can help with society sustainability, social sustainability uh, by improving farmer livelihoods overall. All right, so first things first, we're gonna jump into our economy example from Mexico. And so my first slide here is just to tell you a little bit about the history of cotton in Mexico, because I learned about this um, as I was preparing. And so um, you'll see Mexico, uh, grows cotton in a very particular region in the north of Mexico. Again, the water stressed region of the world, it makes sense. Um, and cotton contributes about 1% of the total agricultural GDP in Mexico, which is a, a solid chunk for sure. And like I said, is mostly grown through irrigation um, from rivers in, in kind of the more arid regions of the country. Um, and while it, it seems like a kind of a small area and a small percentage, it's really considered a key crop in Mexico as part of their national agricultural strategy um, focused on cotton and of course has historical significance uh, as the Mexican textile um, industry has changed over time. And so biotech cotton in Mexico was particularly attractive because they, as well as the southern United States, struggle with a pest called the pink bollworm. Uh, which throughout the 1900s was really plaguing cotton production. Uh, sorry, this picture is kind of gross, but I wanted to show you what they look like. Um, not only do they look gross, they were reducing yields by up to 50% across cotton growers in the Southern US and Mexico in the 1900s. Um, and they were spraying pesticides like crazy, of course, insecticides to try to stop this pest up to 18 times per season, some years to try to protect the cotton. Um, so that's a, a ton of inputs and a ton being released into the environment. Um, but then as we, we learned, biotech cotton, BT cotton came into play in 1996 um, in both the US and Mexico and now represents more than 95% of all the cotton grown in Mexico. And so I have a couple graphs to kind of tell you about the impact of biotech cotton over time. Um, and in the upper left here, we're looking at a, a chart um, of the dark line is showing the pounds of insecticide that are used per cotton acre over the years. And so you can see um, from the kind of late 90s, it's dropped significantly um, to, let's see, from around two and a half pounds to close to half a pound uh, per acre. So at the same time, that dotted line shows the amount of cotton uh, being grown in Mexico. And so you can see that's continued to grow while the insecticide use has gone down. So that's been a huge um, benefit for farmers' expenses um, and of course has helped um, get rid of the food source and kill off a lot of the pink bollworm. And so the graph on the bottom left here um, is showing some of the, they set out traps to catch the moths that uh, emerge from pink bollworm eggs um, over and, you know, metamorphosis. <laughs> and you can see that uh, as of sort of the 2010 and on, there are hardly any moths being captured anymore, which signifies that a lot of the pink bollworm has been eradicated, which they consider a huge success. Um, you know, not only is the, the pesticide helping keep the pests away, but they're, they're decreasing in their prevalence. And so that led to, on the right, uh, our US uh, Secretary of Agriculture released a, a proclamation um, in the early 2000s that pink bollworm was indeed eradicated from the United States. So that was a, a big win for cotton uh, and a big threat to its production at the time. Uh, and so before we move on from this example, when we think about the economic sustainability, a lot of people point out that biotech seeds cost more, which makes sense. There's more technology and development costs involved with making those seeds. Um, and, and so it's important that the farmer is gaining the amount of money uh, and more that they have to pay for those seeds. Um, and so for some countries, that's a cost benefit analysis it doesn't really work out. Um, and so this, this graph is showing um, a bunch of countries here on the far left. And then in the middle column, it's showing the percentage increased in, in seed costs for BT cotton versus the original type of cotton. And so you can see in Mexico, it does cost uh, almost 60% more to get BT cotton seeds. Um, but then the last column is showing how much percent more are they making as a result of that. And you can see they're making almost 300% more uh, income 
from those BT cotton seeds. So the benefits far outweigh those economic costs for farmers in Mexico, which is really excellent. And so if people have questions and stuff they want to put in the chat as we go, I'm happy to sort of stop along the way. Um, but otherwise, I'll keep chugging along. Um, so the next category of sustainability is environment, like I mentioned. So a little background about cotton in Australia in general. So 90% uh, of the cotton grown in Australia is grown by generational family farms, which I thought was, was really interesting um, and unique and makes it a really important crop for a lot of individual families there. Um, it contributes 30 to 60% of the agricultural GDP uh, in those two states on the far east side where it's grown. Uh, so a really important financial um, benefit for those two states in Australia. But of course, its production, as I mentioned, is highly dependent on rainfall. It's a lot of rain-fed cotton production. And so this graph on the bottom right is showing cotton production in Australia over the years. You can see it oscillates widely um, depending on how much rain they have from the, in that year. Let me see if I can see the chat. I can't see the chat. Nor do you want to tell me if there's a question I can answer now or save it for the end? Yes, um, we have a question from Martha. Why is the USA ratio so bad compared to China and Mexico? Oh, on that economic slide. Uh, that is a great question. Um, and I think in part it's it's because of the date this study was done. You can see this was uh, fairly old in 2008. Um, uh, so I actually don't know. But you're right, China, China looks great. Um, the U.S. seems like it's about equal, relatively. But yeah, that's a good question. So jumping into environment, I wanted to say a little about uh, biotech cotton in Australia. Um, so as I mentioned, they were, along with Mexico and the U.S., one of the first adopting countries in 1996. Um, and over the last 20 years have resulted in a 90% reduction in insecticide use, similar to what we saw in Mexico, um, which is excellent. So that's this, this graph we have on the right is insecticide use for cotton over time uh, with um, conventional and BT. Um, and of course, it, it now accounts for more than 98% of the land of the cotton grown in Australia. Um, so it's really been heavily adopted um, and a big reason for that is not just because of the pest resistance itself, which is wonderful, um, but I'll show you on the next graph. It's actually allowed farmers in Australia to adjust when they grow cotton, um, which has allowed them to rely more on rain and less on irrigation, which is costly and water intensive for them to grow cotton. So two, two graphs that sort of summarize this. I'll talk about the left one first. Um, it's, this graph is showing the prevalence of certain parasites or pests that are related to cotton and that decrease yields over the growing season. So that's January to July. Um, and so you can see from those the dark and the dotted lines that the um, adult prevalence of these bugs is really at its peak in February, um, which is correlated with when it's the most rainy in Australia because the pests thrive in the wet season. Um, but before BT cotton, that meant that to avoid spraying a ton of pesticides, uh, farmers, cotton farmers in Australia were just waiting until later in the spring to plant their cotton, which means that they miss the rainy season, uh, but they at least miss the pests as well. So with the introduction of BT cotton that made those pests uh, basically die as soon as they tried to eat BT cotton, that meant that the farmers were able to shift their growing season back a few months. So you can see on the graph on the right, um, the sowing season now, um, after the introduction of BT cotton, is now earlier around January and February, which means that they're able to take advantage of the rainy season and only have to use irrigation water near the end of the crop season. So that's been a huge benefit to the water intensive uh, intensiveness of Australia's cotton agriculture. And so here's just some kind of summary graphs of that, you can see that the total cotton production over this time from 2000 to 2011 has, you know, ebbed and flowed, but has ultimately gone up as a result because more farmers are able to grow cotton more sustainably. Um, 
And then on the right hand side, these graphs over the same time are showing on the top solid line, the total yield of cotton in Australia. And you can see that's uh, gone up about 20%. And at the same time, the dotted line, the water application to cotton from irrigated sources has gone down um, about 10%, almost 10%. So that's been really great and has allowed Australian farmers uh, to expand their growth of cotton and do so in a way that isn't using a ton of irrigated water um, and having those impacts on the environment as a result. And so my last case study to jump into here is um, from India, thinking about farmer livelihoods and how BT cotton can, can, can help with that in India. And so again, kind of a, a broad overview of the cotton industry in India. Uh, cotton India is one of the top cotton producing countries in the world. Uh, they produce about a third of the global cotton area, um, or they have about a third of the global cotton growing area. Uh, and it contributes 30% of their national agricultural GDP. So if you remember compared to Mexico, cotton was about 1%. Uh, in India, it's about 30%, uh, which is a, a huge contribution to farmers. Um, and then similar to the stat we had for Australia, I found this um, really interesting that 85% of the farmers that uh, grow cotton in India are in the marginal and small farm category. So less than two hectares of land total. Um, so that means that there's a, a lot more farmers being impacted by changes in technology and cotton production and a lot more families that stand to benefit uh, than in some of the other countries with large farms and large uh, kind of industrial cotton production. And you can see on the graph on the right, just if you're curious, uh, it's sort of the western side of India that has the environment that suits a lot of cotton production. So India was not part of the, the initial adopters of BT cotton, but did adopt it in 2002. Um, and it now accounts for more than 95% of the total cotton area in India. Um, and over the, those 15 years since they adopted cotton, it's shown on the, uh, the growth is shown on these graphs here. Uh, is the cotton production was able to triple um, over 15 years due to BT cotton. Again, because less pests, uh, less resource intensive, less money spent on insecticides um, allowed farmers to do a lot more with less. And so not only did cotton production increase, but as a result, um, the average farm income increased by 50%. So they doubled their income, which has been, I mean, um, you can imagine for a small farmer, that can go quite a long way. And so just to, um, these graphs show you kind of the, the spread of the changes in income for BT versus conventional cotton over the years. Um, and so you can see that um, poor farmers and vulnerable farmers really did benefit a lot in terms of their change in income, the darker bars on the graph here from BT cotton. Um, compared to those who were growing conventional cotton at the same time. Um, and on the whole, that's really benefited the India cotton industry and enabled them to become a net exporter of cotton. That's the graph here on the right. Uh, the millions of tons of cotton that they export was, was near zero. They were using everything they were producing for many years. And with BT cotton, they've been able to export a lot um, and then maintain you know, what they use at home. So that's great for their country and for the, their farmers industry as well. And then um, a little bit of like secondary social benefits from growing BT cotton. Uh, this graph here on the left is showing, uh, is from a study that was looking at for farmers growing BT cotton per hectare, that they're growing BT cotton, how many calories are they consuming? So this is a proxy for uh, how much money the family is making, what their social well-being is, um, how the nutrients their children are getting. And you can see um, that for both of these categories in BT adopting households, uh, they were able to increase the amount of calories they're producing per day. Um, and, and not just total calories, but also the calories from more nutritious food. Um, so that's sort of a proxy for showing that farmers growing BT cotton are able to really um, improve their livelihood more than just directly by making more money, but by um, you know, eat, eating more and eating more nutritious food over time. Um, and then uh, an unfortunate um, thing that's been in the news about India over the years um, has been the prevalence of farmer suicides just due to the stress of the agricultural industry in their country over time. Um, and you can see that, again, as BT cotton was introduced and farmer livelihoods improved, um, that's the red line is showing the amount of BT 
T cotton being produced, uh, farmer suicides dropped significantly um, for those producing it. So um, that's just another uh, a great story um, as a result of BT cotton and the benefits it brought to farmers and their families. So wrapping up with um, kind of a little bit of a look at the bigger picture of, of biotechnology, this is a map of all different types of biotech crops grown around the world. Um, so it's not just cotton, but lots of others as well. Uh, I just think this is kind of a, a nice graph. You can see that um, amongst the most common are corn, soybeans. Um, Bangladesh has BT eggplant is a really unique one. Um, and so, so biotechnology has the potential to adapt and uh, improve sustainability for lots of crops. Um, cotton just being a, a really big success story uh, of one around the world. And so just a few kind of stats for you. 90% uh, of farmers who grow biotech crops are in the developing world. Uh, where they get a lot more bang for their buck by growing kind of the most advanced and modern version of whatever crop they're interested in. Um, 50 billion pounds of carbon dioxide have been saved by folks growing biotech crops from reducing inputs, reducing the need to till the soil, things like that. Uh, it's been able to us as the, as the world to produce 276 million more tons of food, feed, and fiber um, since its introduction um, in the 1990s. Uh, it's reduced total pesticide usage by 9%, um, which is great, but of course there's room for improvement there for sure. Uh, and then it's brought $98 billion of economic benefits to farmers, uh, and half of that being in the developing world, again, where that goes even farther um, than in the developed world. And here's just another quick graphic to show um, a lot of those benefits. Uh, they announced to conserve biodiversity because we aren't using as much land. Um, Again, reducing carbon dioxide emissions, the equivalent of taking 15 million cars off the road. Um, so I could go on about the benefits of biotechnology. Um, but for the sake of time, I wanted to get to um, some of the comparison to organic agriculture, um, in which the big thing that we think about is land use. Um, and so just to, to frame the challenge of land use that we face as, as a global society, um, is that the, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organizations estimates that we've already lost about 420 million hectares of forest in the last like 30 years, uh, which is just a ton. Um, so the size of India and Pakistan combined is what's been lost. Uh, and a main source of this loss has been the expansion of agricultural production. Right? We have to produce more food, feed more people, um, and that means we're losing forest and biodiversity to do that in some cases. And this graph on the bottom here is showing since the 1970s, uh, the world population has, of course, continued to grow and is expected to continue to grow over time. Um, and as a result, the amount of arable land that's actually available for us to grow food uh, is going down. Um, and often because of urbanization, right? We need more space to live, more space to park, whatever it might be. Um, and so the amount of land we even have to work with to grow food uh, is getting smaller and smaller all the time. And so just a quick poll for you guys before I jump to this next slide. <clears throat> Is how you think organic agriculture's land use compares to conventional agriculture or biotech land use. Uh, and so do you think it requires significantly less land to grow cotton and other foods organically? Do you think it requires more land? Or do you think it's about the same? Got two voters. All right, so everyone thinks it requires either about the same or less land to grow food organically. <coughs> um, so in fact, organic agriculture requires significantly more land, about 50% more land to grow food organically. Um, and that's because they aren't using biotech crops, um, which increase the yield per acre. Uh, and they aren't using a lot of the pesticides and things that um, are synthetic but protect crops um, from pests and weather and different things like that. Um, and that means they just need to grow more and take more land 
uh, to produce the same amount of output, whether it's textiles uh, or food. Um, so just a few um, little graphs here. So this is looking particularly at wheat and peas was this interesting study that I found um, in which organic uh, carbon dioxide equivalence was actually, <coughs> when you account for land use specifically, um, required a lot more um, to produce the same amount of food. Um, and so a, a study from, let's see, this was from the Journal of Cleaner or Nature Communications, um, was looking at, okay, how much land would we actually need to grow all of our food organically by 2050 if we wanted to convert it all? Um, and that study showed that we would need 33% more land than we have and would require 15% more deforestation um, in order to do that. And so there's certainly room for, for all of these um, types of farming to coexist, but in a lot of places, especially in cotton that is grown in really water scarce areas, um, there's a lot of benefits that it can offer in combination with, with organic farming. And just to leave you with, with one more chart um, of a study from in of US crops specifically that looked at what are the, the yield gaps in terms of amount of product per acre, uh, what's the gap between growing that product organically or conventionally. Um, and cotton is the number one highest yield gap, meaning you get 45% uh, less cotton um, when you grow it organically versus conventionally, um, mostly the benefits of, of biotech cotton. So that's all that I have. I have definitely room for questions. I also have a quick slide if folks wanna share their takeaways from this presentation, um, but also curious to just have a discussion with anybody who's got ideas or questions. Sorry if I ran a little long, Noor. We can do one more quick menti if you guys are still on that slide or on that website. I was just curious what, what everyone's takeaways would be from this presentation. And I'll try to, I think I can probably see the chat now. No worry about the, no worries about the time, Holly. Um, but I guess uh, my question is, so for a designer looking to source the most sustainable fiber, it's kind of a controversial subject. And when you start delving into it, you get a little confused because a lot of people say organic cotton is better um, so the takeaway from this presentation is that bio cotton is better because it's less taxing on the environment. Um, what about negative impacts on the earth from the, uh, engineering part of the plants or because you're, um, I don't know, meddling with nature a little bit? Sure. I mean, there's, um, I don't, I think that there's plenty of room for organic and biotech crops to both be able to contribute to environmental sustainability around the world. And it really varies by, by context. Um, biotech cotton is really just a more efficient way of the way that we've been breeding crops for many years. Um, you know, before we had kind of the, the laboratory tools that we have to do genetic engineering, we were doing it just by randomness, where we would just cross pollinate different cotton crops randomly, and then grow those um, and see which ones were better. And then if they were the best, then we would grow those seeds, right? So now we're able to more specifically know what is the genetic part of the cotton that's holding it back, or that maybe is um, making it so water intensive or uh, making it susceptible to a pest. Um, so, um, you know, there's there's no kind of um, direct environmental impact um, from producing biotech crops, um, and, and and no kind of direct genetic risk associated with that. It's just kind of a more efficient way we're able to to produce crops and adapt them to our changing climate faster than we used to be able to. That required sort of a a random testing over time. Let's Got see. It. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, does that help? I know yeah. that it's very confusing. There's a lot of marketing out there um, and a lot of, of things that aren't necessarily science-based. Um, 
And so my, my argument to you is just that both there's room for both to advance sustainability, both approaches to producing cotton. Because as far as I know about corn, genetic, genetically modified corn, that it depletes the soil and that it's not as nutritious perhaps than organic corn, but of course we're not eating cotton, but for the designer that's looking for picking the right fabric, the mm -hmm. modified cotton uh, in terms of health too, it doesn't have pesticides on it. So it's equivalent to organic cotton in terms of the health of the wearer, but it has less impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, do you, I don't know that much about the world of cotton. Like when you're buying a product, can, is there some label on it that tells you if it is a, a biotech cotton product? I know there isn't, sorry if I'm skipping. I, I think as a designer, um, you, if you're sourcing fabric, you're going to uh, say your brand is sustainable or uh, you're going to just put on the description of the product or on the label, you know, made with organic cotton, made with this. Mm -hmm. So in terms of how that trickles down to the consumer, um, it's just about how you educate the consumer and what, mm -hmm. what we know about it and what the, um, what the, um, what people think. Right. Yeah. And I thought the, um, the guide to sustainable cotton that I referenced at the beginning that has that kind of nice definition of sustainability. Um, I was reading kind of their approach to this and they are uh, sort of agnostic to biotechnology or not. Like you can, you can have biotech, you can have organic, whatever works best for you to achieve the desired outcome of sustainability is more is what the important thing is for that product rather than how it was made. And I think that's a, a nice way to think about it. Other, I think Martha, we answered your questions. Um. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions or things you guys just want to talk about? I'm interested as um, kind of folks from the sustainable fashion side, like what what did I not cover that you think is interesting, or that um, you might have wanted to learn about because I know there's a lot more to sustainable fashion than just how it's grown in the field. You know, how does this work throughout the rest of the value chain? Well, I think Noor um, made a good point. I, I'm still confused a bit because the whole greening and being more sustainable is moving towards organic and being um, sort of conscious of the production of whatever material you are using. So as a designer, you shop for something that's going to be more sustainable. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. uh, and then my questions were involved around, let's say I want to buy cotton from the U.S. because it's even more locally grown than mm -hmm. something from India. So it looks to me like there's a lot more information to learn about uh, what's advantageous, either organic or biotech. But mm -hmm. in the end, it's all about education. It's really hard at this point to educate a consumer on the value of biotech. Right. Because lots of um, preconceived notions of what that means. Mm -hmm. So. It, yeah, it, no, I, I totally agree. And I, you know, when we talk about organic too, like the, the definition of organic isn't necessarily straightforward. The same as definition of, of biotech can include lots of things. Right. Uh, and kind of to the point that I was making and that I, I think is something I've learned about recently is like, are we, are we focused on the sustainability in terms of the approach and how it's produced, the methods used, or are we actually focused on the outcomes? of what it's actually enabling and changing in the environment and in society. And the kind of organic label um, that we're used to is really focused on approaches and how it's being produced and not as much on the outcomes because they're harder to measure. That's totally true. And so yeah. um, it's definitely an ongoing education and, and conversation <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> Good points. 
Nina has a good question in the chat is, are there other plants used for fiber on the GE list? And I actually don't know. Nina, are you asking because you know? I'm gonna go back to that slide. No, but I'm asking because I'm curious. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Okay, great. Um, because, um, you know, personal history, I uh, worked in a lab that did some work on switchgrass. I don't know if switchgrass has any potential. Um, mm. uh, flax, I don't know if anybody's working on improvements to that. And I do um, know that hemp as a plant um, in a way is kind of a study in breeding improvement. It's a case study in breeding improvement um, before genetic engineering. It responds really well, apparently. Not that I'm a hemp breeder, but I think if somebody were to go into hemp breeding, it would be highly rewarding because apparently hemp uh, responds quite well to adjustments. And I didn't know kind of what, um, it, where, where I'm originally from Ukraine and historically hemp is a very widespread uh, fiber. Uh, so is flax, uh, that's why I was asking. Um, and also like, you know, palm tree fibers and other stuff like that. But mm -hmm. I, I'm just curious if anybody knows. I'll definitely keep an eye. I've definitely read kind of research about all of those as biotech crops, but I don't think any of them are commercially grown. And know. I've heard recently that um, bamboo, even though it's thought of mm -hmm. as being an excellent fiber, actually takes a lot of resources to process. So it's sort of not on the list anymore of a sustainable fiber because mm -hmm. of the, the um, resources it uses to produce. So it, hemp, yes, is growing more and more to be, uh, you know, it's going up the scale in more sustainable uh, fa fiber to use all around. So nice that point I think it's That's a really good point though. yeah but you know sustainability even my this presentation we were just really really thinking about what's happening in the field the growing of it but there's so much more after that to consider too in sustainability before it becomes something right. we can wear right and so so when you say when you say uh choosing bio cotton versus organic cotton that there's not necessarily one best choice that it depends on your needs um, does that apply to, depending on the location where it's grown, like perhaps in India, it makes more sense to use bio cotton and also for social impact reasons versus maybe in the US or somewhere else. I'm not sure if the US is the right example, perhaps organic cotton would make more sense just in terms of the environment and the natural landscape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. That I think it's really about where the farmer is and what their needs are in terms of, you know, water resources and other resources they have access to. I'm actually not sure, I'm assuming in the US most of our cotton is probably biotech cotton. Nina, you know, is that true? Or call? It's just for past purposes. I mean, just, just uh -huh. the past or so. And you know, Noor, Noor, you know me, I'm new to the to the like plant past world, but I've seen a couple of pictures and I've read a couple of things and <laughs> it's serious. You know, if you want to Google full army worm and um, things that eat cotton, they don't mess around, you know, mm -hmm. until such time as we can, you know, as we switch our emphasis to breeding the worms for whatever purpose, right? When that becomes the crop, we'll revisit this. <laughs> we'll re we can revisit this, but for now we're interested <laughs> in the cotton, you know, and it really, it has like specialized pretty robust past that just comes and eats it. Mm -hmm. you know? So I think you're on the safe side. I, I still think that probably your, your choice of recycling fabric that already exists Right. Um, right. <laughs> that's why. That's why I just went straight. To, that's why I do upcycling because when I started delving into what is the most sustainable fabric to use, what is what does sustainable mean? What 
you know, organic cotton versus this cotton versus, the, it was just so overwhelming. It's like nutrition. There, there yeah. isn't one right answer. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to be lazy. <laughs> I'm going to go with what's simple. <laughs> And I'm just going to upside. <laughs> I'm going to use what's already out here. I'm just going to use what's already out here. This is a big problem that I can solve without having to delve into it. <laughs> but, well, and it kind of harks back to Holly's definition of sustainability that she brought up is when you're, you know, you are on that end that we're done with the field. You know, it doesn't really matter at this point how it got produced, right? It's, it's what happens afterwards. It's the life of the garment, you know, it's it's the diversion from the landfill and creation of opportunity and jobs, which is the economic sustainability in the process. Yeah, which is why I think you know this fits, the, the it all fits together. Yeah, yeah, and and th this is interesting to delve into another side of sustainability also for me and mm -hmm. and a lot of the designers and a lot of people in my audience also they don't just do upcycling or they're not just interested in upcycling so it's it's uh it, this has been really interesting yeah yeah well thank you guys for your good questions oh and i'll put a link in the chat yeah i just wanted to chime in real quick because i was wondering the same thing myself i just uh did a quick look on usa's website and according to them, 88% of U.S. grown cotton is, um, is, is biotech as of 2018. Okay. So not all of it, but a significant majority. Nice. That's great to know. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you so much, Holly, for yeah, being here for today. Me. And um, thank you guys for joining us. And once again, I'm Nora Bashara from Upcycle Design School. The recording of this workshop will be on the blog at upcycledesignschool.com and will also live on YouTube. So feel free to rewatch it later and I will be um, emailing out when the post is ready. So thank you guys so much and hope you guys have a great day. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye everyone.